So what's the big deal with today? And to me, the big picture is pretty much what's rotating up here on the screen. These are some examples of some simple compounds. They're not all that complicated, but they're vitamins. And they're compounds that actually interact in your body, and they, they do beneficial good things. Well, what these drug companies do and how they make a lot of money is they find out exactly what is it that that compound is and what does it do in your body. And they'll just modify it a little bit. They'll move an OH group around. Or they'll add a few more carbons here or there. They really don't know. They're, then they'll shoot it in some mice with that problem. See if it enhances it. See if it really helps. Mega vitamin C or something, right? Tumor drugs, all that sort of thing. It, the idea really is it's identifying the structure of a compound. If you know its structure, you have a lot of power and you can really modify things pretty well. And here's, here's what they are. So a big problem, though, in doing that type of research is getting the really nice pure crystal. And here's some pictures of, of insulin. You need a really pretty, pretty, pretty crystal. Nice edges and everything so that you can do what's called x-ray diffraction. And that's really what's getting at what we're talking about today. I don't think we even use the word x-ray diffraction, but it's really what it's about. Here's some diagrams, some schematics of proteins and some big vitamins and some complicated compounds that they're working on today. And they're modifying because these have these benefit your body, or maybe they're anti-tumor drugs. I forget exactly everything I put up there, but... Okay, so let's take a look at just the fundamentals, the fundamentals of this. We have uh, graphite, and we have diamond. They're both the same element. All right. Brandy, what is that element? Which element? It's the exact same compound. Graphite, the stuff in your pencil lead, or diamond rings, exact same element. They're in just in different forms in the solid. What element is it? Carbon. Yeah. Carbon can be a, in a diamond crystalline structure, or it can be in a graphite crystalline structure. They're both solids but one is much more solid than the other one, all right? And to give you an idea of what's going on there, uh, here, let's take a look at the, uh, the diamond first. Let's see if I can get that movie going. There's diamond. The big green spheres are just carbon. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's kind of like a tetrahedral shape going on in there. And it's really, really tough, hard stuff, right? Take carbon, though, and give it a different crystalline structure, one that allows you to, to write with it. Here's its crystalline structure. It looks like what? Yeah. Well, I think the the individual layers might be kind of tough, but the layers they're they're built so that they can they can slide and slithers one right off the other, and that's why graphite is so slippery. They can, they can use it as a solid lubricant. Okay. This is if you're in the uh, if you ever get a kid and you got to do the uh, what is that derby thing called? The Boy Scouts. What is that derby thing? You guys don't know about this. Yeah, that race car derby thing, and you got to make your own. Well, yeah, and the kid is supposed to make it, but the kids never do. So it's really against the dads, against the dads. Is really what it is. <laughs> so, and I'm kind of competitive. So, but I don't cheat. They say no liquid lubricants. So, what kind of lubricant do I use? I use this one, right? Graphite. It's really slick. <laughs> I ain't cheating. Okay, so. Let's see a little review here. I have sugar, which is, uh, where's sugar? Here it is. C6H12O6. And I have table salt, which is NaCl. 
two different types of compounds, and you've seen them both. They're both these white, crystalline-looking solids, right? Jessica, what types of compounds are these? One is what, and one is what? What was the terminology for these two types of compounds? One starts with an I. Ionic compound. One of them is an ionic compound. Consists of ions in this crystalline structure. We're going to talk about the type of crystalline structure, but which one is it? The salt, the sodium chloride. That one, well, this one, right? That one is an ionic compound. The C6, H12O6, the sugar, that is what type of a compound? It's made up of, there's an M, molecules. It's molecular. This is, a, this is a molecule. C6H12O6 is a molecule. How do I know it's a molecule? All you do, the trick, remember the trick? Look at the chemical formula, and you don't see a what? You don't see a metal. There's no metal there. It has to be a molecule. No matter how complicated it is, you don't see a metal. It has to be a molecule. OK, there's a little review. OK, so you have all these different types of solids. And these solids are held together by one, two, three, four different types, right? One, two, three, four different types of forces that are holding these different types of solids together, OK? Some, you see the arrow going up, so I guess that means stronger, right? So the strongest one is this covalent network. And that's, for example, diamond. How would you represent diamond? Well, I guess you could write C solid. But it's hard to tell. It's really poor convention, poor terminology. Because how do you know it's diamond and not graphite? Right? C solid, right? Or charcoal. Okay. But the point I'm trying to get at is if you see an element all by itself and it's not a metal, it's a nonmetal, silicon, carbon. Okay? Pick one, right? If it's sitting there all by itself, that's got to be covalent network held together by what type of bonds? Covalent bonds. Very, very strong stuff. Diamond. Ionic solid. OK. Now you know you have an ionic solid that you're worried about, Alyssa, if you see a what? A metal. You see a metal with a nonmetal, right? I don't know, pick a metal. Iron, pick a nonmetal. Sulfur, I don't care, right? Just you have to have a metal and a nonmetal, and you'll, you'll have an ionic solid. Held together by, AJ, probably what? Ionic bonds. What's an ionic bond? Eric, what's an ionic bond? Yeah, what makes it stick together? The cation has a what charge? Positive, anion, negative. Opposites stick together. I should write down ionic bond here. We kind of skipped it. What makes covalent bonds stronger? They're actually what? Electrons in between the two atoms, and they're being shared. Yep. OK, metallic solid. Oh, that'd be an example. What would be an example of a metallic solid? Yeah, any metal. Just don't throw a nonmetal with it. Keep it a metal. Wow. Copper. That would be a good one. Calcium, right? That looks like calcium, kind of. But yeah, just a metal all by itself. Metallic solid. <coughs> oh, we didn't do our little sodium chloride animation. We got to do that. Right? Ionic solid is held together by ionic bonds. Let's do that sodium chloride animation. Here it is. Need some volume. Wake you up. Sodium chloride is typical of ionic solids. The crystal contains alternating sodium cations and chlorine. Already they screwed up. If you just write Na, you just write Cl, are those ions? No, that's a sodium atom and a chloride atom. They should be ions. They should have a plus on the sodium and a negative sign on the 
CL, but it's the best animation I could find. But Fluoride anions packed in a three-dimensional array. Ionic solids are brittle if deformed and will fracture along planes of packed ions. So they're they're brittle, but they still have a pretty high pretty high or pretty low melting point if they're held together pretty strong. Well, pretty high melting point. Yep. Okay. Metallic solid is held together by must have something to do with electron C. Bonding in metals is described by the electron C model. Solid metals behave as if constructed of a repeating pattern of metallic cations surrounded by delocalized electrons. These electrons are free to move among the many cations in the crystal. This model explains the relatively high electrical and thermal conductivity of metals. When deformed, no bonds are actually broken. Instead, cation planes slip past one another, leading to the metallic properties of ductility and malleability. Whoop. Bonding in metal. These so what they're trying to say is, uh, pick a metal, copper, iron, whatever, sodium. And they're trying to say that, okay, here's all the nuclei, right, the copper. Copper has how many protons? You remember this kind of stuff. Cu's 29. Copper has 29 protons. How many electrons? For each copper atom. AJ, how many electrons? Same. Same. 29. Okay. So they're saying, okay, if I have, what is it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 by 6. That's 36 atoms here. And nobody knows whose electrons are whose. Each copper atom is throwing it, tossing in 29 electrons, but its nucleus is still here, so they're kind of nice and distributed. But everybody's electrons, everybody's, and they're just kind of like this big sloth moving all, moving all between them. And it has to be between them so that, you know, one, I can't write on there, but one nuclei is being sucked to the middle, the other nuclei is being sucked to the middle, right? Because that's where all the electrons are hanging out. That's what they're trying to say holds the thing together, and that's what they think. But that theory works for everything that we've been doing and experimenting with, right, this electron C model. It really explains well why things conduct. But OK, that's, that's our electron C model. So on the big picture of things, it doesn't have that great of a melting point. I think it's copper. All these metals are so soft in the first place. But the guys with the lowest melting point, the guys that are the easiest to melt, are these molecular solids. Okay, so that means a molecule. I don't know. What, oh, Albert, give me a chemical formula of a molecule. Just don't give me a metal. Oh, don't say Na, right? SO4 part's good, right? Oh, sulfur tetraoxide or something, right? I don't know if it exists, but I don't care, right? It's, I know, I don't know if that exists, but I know it's SO2 exists, right? You have to draw those Lewis dot structures and make sure everything works. But I know this works, sulfur dioxide, okay? So you have solid sulfur dioxide. What holds it together? Molecular solid. Okay. Now, what type of forces hold a molecular solid together? Intermolecular forces. That's why this guy's at the bottom of the pack. These are the weakest. Well, intermolecular forces. Okay. Let's erase some of this stuff. Play a little game here. See if you can tell me what's going on. I'll give you a compound and you tell me which category it falls into. How about uh, H2O? Molecular. How about uh, mm, zinc? Metallic solid? Yeah, metallic solid. How about uh, Argon. Well, that's a tough one. 
I don't think he's going to bond with himself. All right? That's not a good example to fit in. I bet you that I, it's going to be molecular solid, even though it's a molecule. That's a poor example. Let's do a different one. Let's do uh, here. O2, oxygen. It's molecular solid. Why isn't it covalent network? Because O2 is a is a the M word. O2 is a molecule. It's a molecule. O2 is a molecule. This is the one. This is the one you're itching for. Germanium. That would be a what? Fall into. It would be metallic solid if it's a metal. But it's right on that stinking bridge thing. Germanium is a non-metal. It's going to be covalent network. It's going to be covalent network. Okay. So we'll, we'll play more of that game later. We'll do some more of those. But that's what's coming. Types of crystal lattice. Okay, so you have salt, fructose, whatever. Here's three types of crystalline lattice. And all they are is, is this is how the atoms are arranged in space, and it's just repeating again and again and again for infinity. Okay, and if it's a perfect crystal, there's no imperfections. But, you know, there's really some. But this is the idea. And we're only going to talk about three of them. And we're going to have some homework questions that's going to ask us to predict what type of crystal lattice certain compounds are. So let's see what the trick is here. Each of these orange balls is supposed to be an atom, okay? And if you look at what we're going to try to do is try to figure out how many atoms are in each unit cell. Number of atoms in each unit cell, okay? So in the, for example, in the simple cubic, you could almost say zero because none of them are totally in it. Like, these guys are right on the corner. They're right on the corner, right? And there's eight corners. There's four there. There's another four over here. But mathematically, one-eighth of each atom is in the corner. One-eighth, each atom in a corner, one-eighth of it is inside the box. So if each atom on the corner one-eighth of it is inside the box. So in total, how many atoms would a simple cubic have then? Just one. That's the thing you got to remember. This guy has just one. There's one atom per unit cell if it's simple cubic. Because one-eighth of each atom throws into the total at the corners. Body-centered cubic. Okay body-centered cubic. He's got the same thing as a simple cubic going on, but he's got an entire atom right in the middle. So the number of atoms in a body-centered cubic would be two. Exactly. Okay, now the face-centered cubic, you have to look at it a little bit more closely. You've still got the eight going on at the corners, just like simple cubic, but now in the center of each face, you've got an atom. And half of it's inside the unit cell, half of it's inside the box, half of it's outside the box. How many would you have now? Well, the corners, all the corners are going to be one, right? And then if you look at this face and this face, Front and back, that's one. Top and bottom, that's another one. And this side, there's another one. So how many do we have there? One, two, three. Total would be four. This is what you need to remember to identify types of crystal lattice in the homework to get it to make these predictions. One for simple cubic two atoms for body-centered, and four for space-centered. So what's the question I'm all worried about? This is it right here. Gold. 
Gold. What's the element symbol for gold? Cassandra, what's the element symbol for gold? AU. Good deal. AU. Has cubic crystals whose unit cell has an edge length of 407.9 picometers. So unit cell, kind of draw two squares, right? Each side is 407.9 picometers. So it's a cube, and the length of a side is 407.9 picometers. Now, I know what's coming summer, so I just want to figure out what a pico is, because we need to know it. What's a pico? Pico means, for example, what did, let's start at the beginning. What did deci mean? 10 to the negative 1. Centi meant 10 to the negative 2. Milli meant 10 to the negative Three. So just to remind you here, if you had 10 millimeters, you could just as well write 10, and then the milli part, 10 to the negative 3, and then put the little meter, right? So you can replace that prefix if you just know what it is. What's pico? I'm going to have 407.9. times 10 to what power? Ooh, someone negative 12. I don't know how you'd know. You pretty much have to Google it. All right? I'm sure I did. Oh, look at that. I'm sure I did at some point. So give you that. Negative 12 meters. OK. The density of this gold is 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. From these data and the atomic mass, calculate the number of gold atoms in a unit cell. Okay, then what type of cubic lattice does it have? So what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how many atoms of gold are in that box. And we, are, we had better get a 1, a 2, or a 4. And if we get 4, well, I think the answer is face-centered cubic. We get 2, body-centered, 1, simple cubic. So the whole question is figure out how many atoms are in there. Okay, how are we going to do this? We know the density is 19.3 grams per cubic centimeter. So let's get started here. We have 19.3 grams of gold per cubic centimeter. What's cubic centimeter? Volume. If we can figure out the volume of that box, get it in cubic centimeters, multiply it, we'll have the mass of the gold. That's really the idea. Get the mass of the gold. Get the total mass of gold in that box, in that unit cell. Okay, So we have to multiply it by the volume. And that volume has to be in cubic centimeters, though. That's the problem. So let's just start up here. In a meter, I have how many centimeters? There's a hundred. Someone said it. There's a hundred. So that means the length of my side is really 407.9 times 10 to the negative 10. I'm just adding exponents. Or you could write, what is that? What would that be? 4.079 times 10 to the negative 12, something like that. Whatever you get on your calculator, just put it here, right? But that's going to be centimeters. Okay, whether you write it like this or not, don't let it worry you. Okay. How do I get volume? Length times width times height. So what do I need to do to the length of this side? Cube it. Someone said multiply it by itself three times, right? Length times width times height. They're all the same thing. So let's find that volume. So that volume is going to be, oh shoot, length times width times height, 407. 
this would be a good one for you to practice on your calculator. 407.9. Now remember how to get this in the calculator times 10 negative 10. So first do the 407.9, and then the EXP and the double zeros pop up. And then you put in 10, hit the plus minus button, and I'll have 407.9 times 10 to the negative 10. Then I have to cube it. And there's a little cube button on there. It's yellow, though. So you have to push Shift, X cubed, and there it will pop up. Ah, 6. I got 6 point, oh, I lost, 7, 9 times 10 to the negative 23, something like that. So 407.9 picometers cubed is the same as 6.79 times 10 negative 23 cubic centimeters. You with me so far? Okay. I have my volume. I'm going to multiply it by my density so my centimeters, my volume units cancel. I'll only get grams then. So take that times 6.79 times 10 to the negative 23 cubic centimeters. And I will get about 1.31 times 10 to the negative 21 grams. That's the mass of gold in that unit cell. So Victoria, this has to be the mass of what were the possible gold number of gold atoms? That has to be the mass of one gold atom, two, or four. It has to be the mass of one, two, or four gold atoms. So it seems to me we just got to figure out what the mass of one single gold atom is, divide it into this, and we'll have our answer. But dang, Maria, how do you get the mass of a single atom of anything? Yeah, I use molar mass. And what? Ooh. Do you hear Alvino? Or not Alvino. Ramiro. Ramiro, right? Where's where is gold? Okay, there it is. 79. Okay. Its molar mass is 196.97 or something. That's the mass of how many gold atoms? A lot more than one. That's the mass of 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd gold atoms. So you get the mass of one of them, divide that molar mass by Avogadro, and we'll have it. We'll have the mass of one. So if you want to see a little equation, I guess you could write this. Mass of one gold atom equals, right, molar mass all over Avogadro. Okay, so that's 196.97 or so. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Okay. 196.97. Divided by 6.022 to 10 to the 23rd, about 3.27 times 10 to the negative 22 grams. That's what one gold atom is. So let's divide that total by the mass of one gold atom. See if we get a, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully we get a one, two, or four, right? better, otherwise this is really going to be a lot of work for nothing. 1.31 times 10 to the negative 21 grams, the total, divided by one gold atom, 3.27 times 10 to the negative 22. Come on, baby, work. Okay, shift. One over times Aha, uh -huh, yes. 4.005. Well, that's 4. It's 
So we have four atoms in the unit cell. That was the answer to calculate the number of gold atoms in a unit cell. My answer is four. And then what type of cubic lattice would it be? Face-centered cubic. Face Face-centered cubic. Okay. So on these types of questions, figure out how many, how much the total mass of the gold or total mass of the element that they're talking about, right, by taking the density that they have to give you times the volume of that unit cell. The volume of that unit cell is length times width times height. Trick is make sure those darn units cancel, right? Otherwise, you're out of luck. Then once you get that total mass, which is this one, right? Divide it by the mass of one atom. And how you get the mass of one atom? Take the molar mass and divide it by Avogadro. And then you'll get one, two, or four. If you didn't, you screwed up somewhere. OK. Let's try, I think, a lot more. A lot of your homework's going to look like this, though. Uh, where's Mar Mari? Where is she? There's she, way over there. OK. Tin. What type of? Solid is that? Metallic. Good deal. Metallic. Lauren, how about the next one? Germanium. Covalent network, because it's just sitting there all by itself, and it's a nonmetal. Sulfur, Monica, S8. Monica Lopez. You agree? Why does it have to be molecular? Because it's a it's a molecule. Non-metal, more than one of them. There's no metal there. It has to be a molecule. How about iodine? I2, Ramiro. Molecular, because again, it's a molecule. So which ones melt the easiest? Brandy, which ones melt the easiest again? Hardly have to heat them up at all, and they're going to be melting into a liquid. The, yeah, the ones at the bottom of the list, which was molecular, right? Yeah, those guys, weakest. Oh, let's see. Well, which ones, if any, Jessica, should be molecular solids? Which ones, if any, are molecular solids? So they can all, anything can be a solid if you make it cold enough, but which ones would be characterized as molecular solids? Silicon tetrachloride, A. Alyssa, she's right. Is there another one? Phone a friend. Yeah, it's D. It's D. What's wrong with B as in boy? You see a metal. Has to be ionic. What's wrong with C? Yeah, it's just a metal again, right? And it's only one, too. That's true. OK. Arrange the following in order of increasing melting point. All right, let's pick on AJ. Increasing melting point, so at the bottom of the list, the very first one you're going to list, AJ, should be the one that's held together the weakest. OK, 
KCLD. Now, if we go back up here, ionic stuff and covalent network are the strongest. They should have the highest melting points. You find the stuff that's molecules, they're held together the weakest. They should have the lowest melting points. So if we're going to list it out, we have to list all, if there are any molecular solids, then list if there are any metallic solids, then if there are any ionic, and leave for last, because they're going to have the highest melting points, covalent network. So you kind of got to figure out what is what here. So there's two, mo there's two molecules up here. B and C are the molecules. Both of these guys are molecules. Molecular. How do you spell molecular? Oh my goodness. Molecular. OK. That means intermolecular forces are holding together. But one is more weakly held than the other one. Which one is more weakly held? Why is B more weakly held than C? Yeah. This, that hydrogen bonding thing. You're going to have hydrogen bonding in both of these. But in C, that oxygen is much more accessible. Plus, it's already got an H on it. It really, really helps. So. C has you know, higher, stronger intermolecular bonding, a higher degree of hydrogen bonding than B does. So if you're going to list them in order of increasing melt point, melting point, B would have to be first. Then C. OK. Now you have to worry about D and A. Eric, what do you think? What would be the weaker among those two? Well, when you think of farther apart, that's the polarity idea. But this, these aren't, these are, are these, uh, is there a metal in here? Yes. yes. So we don't think of polarity. Now we've got to think of just ionic solids. A and D. What's holding together A? What are the ions? What are the ions that are holding together A? CA with what charge? Plus 2. O with a? Negative. negative 2. Now, what's holding together D? Ions again. But what are the charges? Plus 1, minus 1. Does that help? Which one's weaker? Why is KCL weaker? Yeah, smaller charges. So D is next. And then A. B is first. B is hard to tell. You don't you don't know B is first until you've seen the trick in the homework. And this oxygen, because hydrogen bonding needs an H and what were the two elements? O and F. Okay, we've got our O. Right, right there. Except in B, the O is a little more cumbersome. It's, it's tied up more. It's surrounded. But in C, that OH is flopping around. He can, he can align himself. If you remember the little videos, the little, o, the little O's can line up with the H's and the, they can move around and they can really align up and they can interact and get the dashed line stronger. I mean, it, it's a much stronger interaction. Much more accessible. Accessible is the word, I think. That oxygen is much more accessible in C than it is in B as in boy. That's why. OK. OK, do this one. Arrange these in order of increasing melting point again. Increasing, so the weakest to the strongest. And I'll ask somebody about this.
Arrange them in order of increasing melting point. Again, to pick between B and C for sure. All righty. Vanessa, what did you list first? She put D first. Everybody agree? At the bottom of the list has to be molecules. Are there any molecules? Yeah, B and C are molecules, so don't mess with D yet. You gotta pick between B and C. Now I hear C, I hear a lot of C's. B has an OH. What was the, what was the strongest type of intermolecular force? Hydrogen bonding. So this guy's got hydrogen bonding going on. It's pretty strong. Well, it's weak in comparison to ionic bonds, but in terms of intermolecular forces, that's about as strong as it gets. How about in C? What type of intermolecular force is going on there? You could have some dipole-dipole, but you really don't have anything that's really electronegative. So you could argue for dipole-dipole, or you could argue for London. Pretty much London, because I don't, you don't see anything that's near, close to the F up there. So the most common answer would probably be London. So the weakest would be, the lowest melting point would be C. Then B. Okay. So Caroline, you agree? So Jasmine, what would be next then? She says D. Everybody agree? D? I see some yeses, I see some noes. What's supposed to be, what's tougher? What is a higher melting point? Covalent network or ionic solids? Covalent network has a higher melting point. This guy's covalent network, right? Silicon, not a metal. So he's got to be covalent network. I would list A last. I think Jasmine's right. D. Okay, we're about out of time, but we got pretty much everything done. So come by if you have some questions. We'll be glad to help you out.